fourth grade. Today we are going to be reading chapter 10 together and we are going to be completing a four square. Before you get started you'll need your book and you'll need a piece of paper set up with the four square and numbered one, two, three, four. If at any point I'm going too quickly with a question or I move on and you're still writing, feel free to pause the video or rewind to hear more of what I've said or to have me repeat the question to you in the video. I will keep this up here so that you can reference back to it, and I will also put the questions in the description of the video below if you need to reference back. So everyone should be, if you have this version of the book, everyone should be on page 127, in which Cimmerine and Alianora conduct some tests and disturb a wizard. Back in the kitchen, Cimmerine and Alianora quickly determined that the fireproofing spell had indeed worked. First Cimmerine, then Alianora, tossed a pinch of feverfew into the air and recited the spell verse, then put a hand into a candle flame and held it there. Neither was burned at all, though Alianora claimed that the candle tickled almost as much as the eagle feather had done. How long does the spell last? Alianora asked. I'm not sure exactly, Cimmerine said. At least an hour, but I'll have to do some tests to pin it down beyond that. I hope Kazul gets back soon. I want to see if it works with dragon fire. You're going to have Kazul breathe fire at you just to see if the spell works? Alianora said, horrified. What if it doesn't? Then I'll talk to Kazul and we'll go see Morwen, and the three of us will try to figure out what to change to make the spell work for dragon fire too. Don't look at me like that. I'm not going to stand in front of Kazool and have her breathe fire at me. I'll just stick one out a finger, the way we did with the candle. This wasn't not enough to convince Eleonora, but Cimmerine was determined. The whole point of trying this spell was to make ourselves immune to dragon fire, she said. If it doesn't work, I don't want to find out for the first time when one of Kazool's guests gets mad and breathes fire at me because he doesn't like the way I cooked his cherries jubilee. Alianora had to admit that this was a good point, but she was still disposed to argue. The discussion was cut short by Kazul's return. At first, the dragon was more inclined to agree with Alianora than with Cimmerine, but after Cimmerine proved her invulnerability to candle flames, lighted torches, and the fire she had built in the kitchen stove, Kazul agreed to the trial. She insisted, however, on working up to full firepower in gradual stages, and Cimmerine was forced to agree. Before they began, Cimmerine threw another pinch of feverfew into the air and recited the couplet again, just to be sure the spell wouldn't wear off in the middle of the test. Then Kazul lowered her head nearly to the ground, and Alianora watched nervously as Cimmerine lowered her hands slowly into various intensities of dragon flame. Finally, Cimmerine stood right in front of Kazul while the dragon breathed her hottest. The spell worked perfectly every time. There, Cimmerine said when Kazul stopped at last. Now we know it works. Aren't you glad? I'm glad, Alianora said fervently, and I hope I never have to watch anything like that again as long as I live. I didn't dare blink for fear you'd go up and smoke while my eyes were closed. Why don't you try it yourself? Cimmerine said mischievously. No, said Alianora and Kazool together. Watching you was bad enough, Alianora went on with a shudder. I believe it works. I don't see any reason for me to test it. Besides, I've done more than enough fire breathing for one day, Kazool added. I'm starting to get overheated. All right, if you don't want to, you don't have to, Cimmerine said. If we're all done, I'd better go tidy up. Alianora stayed to help Cimmerine finish cleaning up the traces of the spell, by which time she had calmed down considerably and was very nearly her usual self again. Cimmerine gave her a pouch full of dried feverfew before she left, and made her recite the words that activated the spell several times, to make sure she had memorized them correctly. Remember, you only have to repeat the first half of the verse to get the spell going, now that it's been set up, Cimmerine said. Can you do it? It's only two lines and they rhyme, Eleanor said, laughing. How could I forget that? My memory isn't that bad. Maybe not, 
but say it anyway, Cimmerine said. Alinor laughed again and did so. At last she set off into the tunnels, and Cimmerine went back to the main cave to see what Kazul and Roxham had found out about the caves of fire and night. Kazul was somewhat out of temper, and Cimmerine thought privately that she had been telling the truth about getting overheated. Rather than annoy the dragon further, Cimmerine asked if she could read the book Kazul had borrowed from Morwen. It's in the treasure room, Kazul said. Read it there, and I hope you see something in it that we didn't. Cimmerine nodded, picked up her lamp, and hurried off before Kazul could change her mind. The book was lying near a pile of sapphires next to an ornate gold crown. She picked it up, went over to the table, which was large and very sturdy because it was intended for counting piles of gold and silver coins, and sat down to read. It was even drier and duller than Kazul had said. There were a great many mayhaps and perchances and wherefores strung together in long, involved sentences that compared the strange and wonderful things in the cave to obscure philosophical ideas and odd customs from places Cimmerine had never heard of. After a few pages, Cimmerine put the book down and went and got a quill pen, an ink pot, and some paper so that she could write down the things she thought were important. She didn't want to have to read A Journey Through the Caves of Fire and Night more than once. All right, this is our first checkpoint. First question, why is testing the fireproofing spell so important to Cimmerine? While you're answering that question, make sure you notice that the question is not why or what is the fireproofing spell supposed to do or why does Marine want a fireproofing spell? The question is why is testing the fireproofing spell so important to Simmerine? So for this, you'll want to make sure you flip back the last two pages where they've been testing and see some of the things that Cimmerine says and some of the things that she does that would indicate to you why it's important to test it, not just to have it and not just how it works. I'm going to keep reading. If you are still thinking, still looking, still writing, go ahead and pause the video and then play again once you've finished answering the question. If you're just writing all the questions down now and want to go back and do them all later, you can. But it might be fresh in your mind right now, and it might be a little bit easier since we just read it. For the next three days, Cimmerine spent bits of her spare time in the treasure room, taking notes on the De Montmorency. It took her that long because she never, she, because she could never manage to read for more than a little while without getting so bored that she nearly fell asleep. Her persistence gained her several pages of notes about the caves, but nothing that seemed as if it might be of particular interest to wizards. Alionora came to see her a few days later, looking very cheerful. It worked, she announced as she came into the library where Simmering was going over the notes. Caridwell's gone. Therindel rescued her just the way you said he would. Good, Simmering said. I'm glad something is going right. What's the problem? Alionora asked, seating herself on the other side of the table from Simmering. This, Simmerine said, waving at the paper-covered table. Kazul is sure that the key to what the wizards are after is somewhere in that dratted book she borrowed from Morwen. I copied out everything that looked interesting, but none of it seems like anything a wizard would care about. How do you know that? Alinor asked curiously. I don't, Simmerine said. I'm just guessing. That's the problem. Oh. Alinor picked up the sheet of paper nearest her and frowned at it. What on earth does this mean? Cimmerine looked at the page Alionora was holding. Thus, these caves of fire and night are, in some sense, indivisible, whereas the caves of chance are, by contrast, individual, though it is preposterous to claim that these descriptions are true of either groups of caves in their entirety. 
Ugh, that's one of the bits I copied word for word. The whole book is like that. I think it means that if you have a piece of something from something magical from the Caves of Fire and Night, you can use it in a spell as if it were the whole thing. I can see why you wouldn't be sure, Eleonora said. Do you think it would help you figure things out if you stopped for a while? I have stopped, Simmerine pointed out. Or did you have something more specific in mind? I'm almost out of fever fuel, Eleonora said, looking down at the table. I was hoping you'd come with me to pick some more. You're almost out? Simmerine said in surprise. How did that happen? Eleonora shifted uncomfortably. I've been working that fireproofing spell every hour or so for the past two days, she admitted. Warog has been getting more and more unpredictable, and I don't feel comfortable otherwise. Helena was visiting yesterday when he came in, in the middle of the afternoon, and he was roaring and dripping little bits of flame when he breathed. She was terrified, and I don't blame her. If it weren't for the spell, I'd be scared to death. What's the matter with him? I don't know. He doesn't tell me anything about dragon politics or wizards or whatever he's been getting so worked up about. He's not like Kazool. Simmerine frowned, considering. Maybe Kazool will have some idea what's bothering him. I'll ask her this evening. In the meantime, let's go get that fever few. You're right to say that I could use a break. Oh, good, said Alianora, in tones of considerable relief. I've never picked herbs before, and I'm not sure what fever few looks like. I don't know what I'd have done if you said you wouldn't come. Simmerine put her notes away and got two wicker baskets and a small knife from one of the storage rooms. Up or down? Eleonora asked as they left the cave. Up, Simmerine said. The other way is the ledge I told you about, and I wouldn't be surprised if bits of it are still invisible. Okay, this is our second stop. Now here you're looking for something that is shown to you, not outright said. What piece of information lets us know that Alianora is nervous around Warog before she tells us? So what piece of information, before Eleanor describes and explains why she's been nervous, what piece of information shows us that she is nervous? And I mean, like, now she's more nervous, not just nervous in general, because he's rude. What piece of information shows us that Alianora is nervous around Warog? I guess if we were to make it more specific, I could say more nervous. What piece of information shows us that Alianora is more nervous around Warog now, before she tells us? So what are we... What do we see? What do we hear? What do we find out that shows us that fact before she says so? Once again, if I start reading and you are still working on this question or going back into the text, pause the video. You do not have to rush to keep up with me. I'm not taking long pauses only because you'd get bored if I was just sitting here waiting for you. All right, we're picking up again on page 133. The path through the Pass of Silver Ice twisted and turned past the openings of other dragons' caves. Most of the rocks around the caves had scorch marks, and Cimmerine and Alianora didn't see much growing among them. 
At this rate, we'll have to go nearly all the way to the Enchanted Forest to find any grass, much less herbs, Eleonora complained. Wait a minute, Simmerine said. Look over there, through that crack in the rocks. Doesn't that look like something green? Eleonora's eyes followed Simmerine's pointing finger. Yes, she said without enthusiasm. It looks green. The rock Simmerine had indicated was a large boulder at the bottom of a steep slope. The slope was covered with gravel and looked as if it would be impossible to climb down without skinning a knee or an elbow at the very least. The boulder itself was in two pieces, with just enough space between them for someone to squeeze through, provided the someone was not very large. Come on, let's get a better look, said Simmerine. She walked to the edge of the slope and wrapped her skirts tightly around her legs. Then she sat down with her basket in her lap and slid down the slope, raising an enormous cloud of dust and sounding like an avalanche in the process. She reached the bottom in safety and stood up, brushing at her skirt. The dust was so thick that she could hardly see, and when she tried to call Eleonora, she coughed so hard that she could barely speak. Simmerine, are you all right? It's just the dust, Simmerine said in a muffled voice. She had taken out her handkerchief and put it over her mouth and nose to keep the dust out. It wasn't perfect, but it helped a great deal. Come on, it's your turn. Are you sure we shouldn't just go around? Stop stalling. It's not that bad. That's what you say, Eleonora muttered. But she wrapped her skirts around her, clutched her basket, and slid down the slope. She made even more noise than Simmerine had. When she got to the bottom, she was coughing and choking. Simmerine handed her the handkerchief, and they waited for a moment while the dust settled. Crawling through the split boulder was easier than they expected. The crevice was wider than it had looked from the path and the bottom of the crack was so full of dust and gravel and dead leaves that it was almost flat. Simmerine and Eleonora had to walk single file, and there were one or two spots where they had to turn sideways in order to get through, but it was not really difficult. On the other side of the boulder, the two girls found a lush, green valley. It was bowl-shaped and not very large, but flowers and grasses stood waist-high between the random clumps of bushes that dotted the valley floor. A squirrel, which had been sunning itself on the ledge near the entrance, leapt for a small tree as Simmerine and Eleonora appeared. "'My goodness,' Eleonora said, looking around with wide eyes. "'This place looks as if no one but us has ever been here before. There aren't even any scorch marks on the rocks.' Simmerine blinked. Eleonora was right. Lichens covered the weathered gray rocks that rose above the valley, and small plants grew in cracks and crevices that showed no sign of the touch of dragon fire. That's odd, Simmerine commented. Why? Eleonora asked. Those mountains aren't tall enough to keep dragons from flying over, and they're right in the middle of the dragon's territory. So why haven't the dragons been here? They usually keep a close eye on everything that belongs to them. Maybe they have been here, but they've never found anything to breathe fire at, Eleonora said. Well, I'm going to ask Azul about it when I get back, Simmerine said as she waded into the grass. Why don't you take that side, and I'll look over here. We'll cover more ground that way. First, you better show me what I'm looking for, Eleonora said apologetically. I'm afraid I couldn't tell Feverfew from Carrots if there was a dragon chasing me and my life depended on it. Simmerine nodded, and they started off. They had not gone far when she saw a patch of the white button-shaped flower she was looking for. Here, she said, showing them to Eleonora. This is Feverfew. The younger plants are the best, the ones that haven't blossomed yet. Eleanor studied the leaves and flowers with care. I think I'll recognize it now. They cut some of the plants, leaving those that were blooming. You find the next patch, Simmerine said as they started off again. Let's try over there, Eleanor said, pointing. They found several more patches of feverfew, and gradually their baskets began to fill. I think this should be enough, Simmerine said at last, unless you think... Simmerine, Eleanor hissed, clutching at Simmerine's arm. There's someone behind that bush. Simmerine turned. A dark line snaked through the grass where something large had bent and broken the plants in passing. You're right, she said, and started forward. Eleanor hung back, still holding Simmerine's arm. You're not going to go look, are you? How else are we going to find out who it is? Simmerine asked reasonably. She shook off Eleanor's hand. Quietly, she walked over to the clump of bushes and peered around it. Eleanor followed her with evident reluctance. 
A man in blue and brown silk robes was crouched on the other side of the bush with his back towards Simmering. He was stuffing saw-edged purple leaves into a small linen bag the size of Simmering's hand. His hair was brown, and on the ground beside him lay a long, polished staff. Antarel? Simmering said in surprise. The man snatched up his staff and straightened as if a bee had just stung him. It was indeed Antarel, and he did not look at all pleased to see her. He stuffed the linen bag quickly into his sleeve and said, P Princess Simmerine, what brings you here? I was about to ask you the same thing, Simmerine said. Wizards go where they wish, answering to no one, Antarel said, waving his free hand in a lofty manner. Maybe outside the mountains of mourning they do, but around here they have to check with the dragons first, Simmerine said. You know nothing of the matter. Antarel said, looking very put out. Simmerine? Eleonora's tone was doubtful. You know this person? I'm sorry, I should have introduced you. This is Antarel, one of the wizards I told you about. Antarel, this is Princess Eleonora of the Dushi Tor on Marsh. At the moment, she's the princess of the Dragon Warog. Eleonora curtsied, murmuring something polite and inaudible. Antarel, who had stiffened in surprise when he realized that Cimmerine was not alone, relaxed visibly. Warog's princess? That's all right, then, though he really shouldn't have sent you. But Warog didn't. Ow! said Alianora. The ow was because Cimmerine had hastily kicked her ankle to keep her from telling Antarel too much. Didn't what? Antarel asked, frowning suspiciously. Didn't? No, you were going to be here. Simmerine said. Well, of course he didn't know, Antarel said, looking annoyed. That's the whole point, after all. Simmerine would have very much liked to ask him what the point was, but she was afraid it would make him suspicious again. I don't understand, she said instead, batting her eyes at him. Of course not, Antarel replied in a condescending tone that made Simmerine's teeth hurt. But it doesn't matter. I'm not annoyed with you. I'm so glad, Simmerine murmured. Antarel gave her an oily smile. In fact, there's no need for you to tell Warog that you met me here. I wouldn't dream of it, Simmerine said with perfect truth. Excellent, Antarel said. Then may I escort the two of you back to the path? Alianora looked hopefully in Simmerine's direction. But we can't leave yet, Simmerine said, opening her eyes very wide. We haven't picked any cornflowers or daisies. Behind her, she heard Eleonora making a smothered, choking noise, as if she were trying very hard not to laugh. Daisies, Antarel said in a flat, incredulous tone. You want to stay and pick daisies? Simmerine nodded vigorously. And... Cornflowers and flax and all sorts of things, she said, waving her hand at the flowers blooming all around. They'll look so pretty in a bowl of water in the kitchen. I'm sure you're right, Antarel said. He looked as if he would have liked to object, but couldn't think of anything to object to. Perhaps I could help you, he said reluctantly. Oh, we wouldn't dream of keeping you, Simmerine said. Antarel was clearly reluctant to leave the two girls in the valley, but Simmerine did not give him much choice. After another minute or so of conversation, the wizard was forced to go. He did not use a vanishing spell, but trudged away on foot. Simmerine watched him until he was out of sight among the bushes, wondering whether he had some special reason not to use spells in the valley or whether he simply didn't know the right spells to make himself vanish. That's a relief, Eleanor said. Why did you insist on staying when it was so obvious that he wanted us to leave? I was afraid he was going to turn us into toads or something. I wanted to see what he was up to, Simmerine said. And I don't think Antarel is a very good wizard. He probably couldn't manage anything worse than a squirrel. Eleanor did not appear to find this very reassuring. Simmerine checked to make sure Antarel was out of sight, then went over to the place where he had been standing when she peered around the bush. At first, she did not notice anything unusual. Then she saw a purplish plant oozing sap from the places where several of its spiky, saw-toothed leaves had been broken off. 
Look at this. What is it? Eleanor asked. I don't know, said Maureen said absently. I saw a couple of other plants like this while we were picking feverfew, but I thought they were just weeds. Maybe it is a weed. A wizard wouldn't sneak into the dragon section of the mountain of morning just to pick weeds. They don't even use herbs to cast spells, so what does Antarell want with this prickly-looking thing? Alinora shrugged. Maybe he needs it for something he can't do with magic. I wonder what that would be. Simmerine reached out and carefully broke off a spray of leaves. She wrapped them in her handkerchief and put the packet in her pocket. Let's see if we can find out whether he picked anything else. Antarell had left a dark trail of bent and broken plants to mark the way he had come, so his path was easy to follow. Simmerine and Alinora searched carefully along it for some way, looking for signs that the wizard had picked, picked other herbs, but neither of them saw any. I don't think there's anything to find, Eleonora said, pushing her apricot-colored hair out of her face. And it's getting awfully warm. Have you noticed that there aren't any of those purple plants along here? Simmerine said. I'll bet that was all he wanted. Then let's leave before that wizard thinks to circle around to check on what we're doing, Eleonora urged. Simmerine doubted that Antrell would think of doing such a thing, but she nodded agreement, and the two girls left the valley. Alinora was quiet and thoughtful for most of the walk back to Kazul's cave. Simmerine was grateful for her silence. She had a lot to think about herself. From what Antrell had said, it seemed likely that Warog was helping the wizards somehow, or at least that he had known what Antrell was looking for in the little valley. Simmerine found it difficult to imagine a dragon helping a wizard, but she couldn't say with certainty that it was impossible. And if Warog was involved with Antrell and Zeminar, it might explain why he had been so touchy lately. All right, this is our third stop. This time, I'm asking for your opinion. So this is an author and me. You have to look back at the story, some of the details, and then figure out what you think. Why do you think Warog doesn't want, or sorry, Antarell doesn't want Warog to know that he was in the valley. Uh oh cut off here. Okay, well, we'll try and prop it up a little bit so you can see it better. Let's see. do for now. All right. Why do you think, so what are your theories on why Antarell, the wizard, wouldn't want Warog, the dragon, to know that he had been in that valley? So Simmerine plays dumb and is like, oh, I don't understand. And then when he says, oh, you don't even need to mention to Warog I was here, she's like, oh, I wouldn't dream of it. Because of course she's not going to talk to Warog anyway. But why would Antrell want to make sure that they didn't talk to Warog about it? What do you think? Once again, if you're still answering, writing out your full thought, pause the video and then you can restart it to have me read the rest. I'll be reading the last little chunk starting from page 141 at the bottom. When they arrived back at the cave, Simmerine shook herself free of her preoccupation. She and Alianora unloaded their baskets and tied the herbs in bunches to hang in a dark corner of the kitchen to dry. Here we go. How long will it be before I can use the fever few? Alianora asked worriedly. I'm not sure, Simmerine said in a considering tone. It will take at least a week to dry thoroughly, but you might be able to use it in the spell before then. The directions don't say how dry the fever few has to be. We could try it every day with a pinch of leaves from one of these bun bunches if you'd like. 
Alianora nodded. I really do need it. I wonder if it would work without being dried, Simmerine said. She pulled a leaf from one of the hanging plants and shredded it carefully between her fingers, then tossed it up in the air and recited the rhyme. There. Now light a candle or another lamp or something. Alianora had already lit a candle and set it on the table. Simmerine moved over and stuck her finger in the flame. I think it's working, she said, and moved the rest of her hand closer. The sleeve of her dress caught fire. Simmerine hastily pulled her hand away from the candle and slapped at the flames, while Alianora snatched up a bucket of water from beside the sink and poured it over Simmerine's arm. The fire went out, and so did the candle, and both Simmerine and Alianora got thoroughly soaked. Oh, dear, Alianora said, ignoring her soggy skirts. Simmerine, did you burn yourself? No, Simmerine said, looking at her arm with a puzzled expression. I didn't feel a thing. I thought the spell worked, but nothing caught fire when we tested it before. It must be because the fever view is fresh instead of dried, and I had hoped that I'd be able to use it right away. If you're that low on dried fever view, take some of mine, Simmerine offered. Kazul's not particularly irritable. I only need to keep a pinch or two in case of emergencies. Thank you, Alianora said fervently, and Simmerine turned her soggy cuffs back and went to get the bottled spices. All right, that's the end of chapter 10, our last question. Hi, fourth grade. So for whatever reason, my video stopped recording as soon as I finished reading the chapter and before I wrote on the last question. Here's the last question. When will the fresh fever few be ready to use properly? So I'm asking you not um, how the fever few works or anything like that, but they just picked some, when will that be ready to use properly? Because we just learned from how um, they reacted with the fire that fresh fever few means it only works partially. Simmerine didn't feel any of the flame, but her clothing burned. So when will it be ready to use properly? When will it actually work thoroughly for the spell? Um, so when you guys are done, um, you will have a sheet with four questions answered. Make sure they're answered thoroughly, not just one word responses. If you have a one word response, I just know it's not gonna be a proper answer that will be correct. So make sure that you are careful with that. If you are confused and you wanna watch back, you can listen to me read it again or just look back in your own book. If you have any questions about the questions and you don't understand them, message me, though I do think I explained each one as, as we went. So just watch back in the video if you want me to hear me want to hear me explain it again. Sorry, I'm flustered because it turned off that first time. But at least you have the whole chapter read in that first video. Please um, reference back to that if you need to.